Hello, my fantastic friends. Welcome to another grab and go video brought to you by the Dubuque Museum of Art. My name is Caitlin and I am one of the educators there. Remember, if you signed up, you can go and grab a bag of supplies and craft ideas from our other very talented educator, Hana. The bags will remain at the museum all through November and to sign up, all you need to do is check the website. So I am very excited about today's topic because it's something I think is really, really cool. Today, we'll go over the basics of the Stone Age, what kind of stuff they made, and why we think they might have made it. The Stone Age is a chunk of history when humans, that means us, first showed up on the planet. It spans a huge amount of time, dating back to millions of years ago. Now, that's a crazy long time to go over, and a lot of our info is educated guessing. We have some solid dates and ideas about these people, but you guys will definitely hear me say words like about and around. Prehistory is a messy, messy thing and can be confusing at times, so it's okay if you have to rewind or watch this again. So with all of that, let's get going. The Stone Age starts around 2.6 million years ago and is the very beginning of us. The Stone Age is also divided into about six different time periods, and the very first one is called the Oldowan period. Now, Oldowan humans didn't really look like people today. For the most part, they walked upright, they had much smaller brains, and they had hair all over their bodies. There used to be a lot of other types of humans, just like there are a lot of different types of cats in the world. There are lions, bobcats, house cats, tigers, and more. And they all have things that make them cats, but they're also very different animals. Humans a long time ago were in the same boat. They were all human, but very different animals. Modern humans are sapiens. I'm a sapien, you're a sapien, everyone you will ever meet is a sapien and all other types of humans went extinct. That's something that we'll go over later. Now, during the Old One, sapiens, us, weren't around yet, but our ancestors were. And they began making something very, very special. They made tools, but not just tools. Lots of animals make tools. Our ancestors and the other Old One humans made a tool that made another tool. They made a thing to help make another thing. Most tools at this point were made of wood, but along came the hammer stone. This was a hard rock that was used to hit a softer rock into a certain shape. By doing this, they made choppers, scrapers, points, and discs. This made processing food much easier for the early humans. Back then, the way humans got food was they hunted small animals, scavenged a bunch of dead animals, and gathered plants and insects. They couldn't really talk other than simple sounds like grunts and hand gestures, but eventually they were able to talk about objects and places, sometimes to warn each other. The Old One period was a time where we weren't making art, but we were making something. And every time we made something, life got a little bit easier. So I want you to take a moment and close your eyes and imagine you are an Aldewan human. Your body is covered in hair and your hands and feet are extremely rough because you have no shoes or gloves. You live in groups, but you don't really have conversations with your friends. And you wander and roam from place to place. There are no houses or even huts. You spend most of your time out hunting or gathering food, and even more time thinking about how to get food. Although you and your friends have gotten pretty good at working with rocks and stone, you end up making some simple tools that help you out. After the Old One period, came the Paleolithic period. Now, at the start of the Paleolithic, around 1.7 million years ago, people began losing their hair and their brains got a lot bigger. Those simple stone tools helped bring in more food. More food meant less time hunting. And less time hunting meant more time socializing. And then there was a change. It's at this point we started making things symmetrical, meaning looking the same on both sides. This was proof that we started understanding shapes 
and which shapes worked better than others. We were starting to pay attention to what things looked like. After that, we made the hand axe, spears, and a whole bunch other complex tools. These more advanced tools helped us to hunt bigger animals and cut down tougher plants. And just like before, the better tools made us better hunters. And the better hunters we were, the more food we got. The more food we got, the less time we spent hunting, and the more time we spent socializing and thinking. Now, just like the Aldawan people, early Paleolithic people were nomads, meaning they still wandered around, they roamed, and didn't really stay in one place for too long. And just like today, the cultures were all different. These roaming groups of humans were called bands, and there were only about 24 to 30 per group. At this point, a couple types of humans had gone extinct, and a couple new types had evolved. Nothing was permanent for these humans. People moved to a new place weekly or even daily. They carried what they needed on their backs, and if you couldn't keep up with the traveling group, you were either left behind or killed. Life was rough, but because there was more time now to spend with friends and family, people were talking more than ever. And now they could talk about the past, the present, and the future, along with places and objects and sounds and gestures. Sometimes when bands of humans would meet, they would fight. But also, a lot of times they would group together and share the information that they've learned along their way. So now, imagine you are an early Paleolithic human. You would have less hair. Your brain would be smaller than today's, but it's getting bigger. You and your band still wander around, and your hands are still rough from making those stone tools. But those tools mean you don't have to hunt as often. You make a spear and can take down large animals. Because you have more time, you spend more time with your friends. Sometimes you meet other bands and talk about future plans or past events. Sometimes the bands look like you, and sometimes they don't. But you still tell them about the types of plants that are good to eat, and they still tell you about the predators to the north. Now in the Middle Paleolithic, this is where things really start to get rolling. Sapiens, remember that's us, were now around, and alongside us were Neanderthals, Denisovans, and a bunch of other humans. An ice age was setting in, but luckily the humans of the world had mastered fire, and not long after, cooking. Fire provided much needed warmth in the cold ice age, along with protection from predators. Cooking killed germs, but also softened hard-to-eat food. Because of cooking, people could eat foods that before couldn't be digested, and so wouldn't be eaten. As an example, today's chimps spend about five hours a day just chewing their food. So, as a result, our intestines got shorter, and can you guess where all that energy went? As our intestines got smaller, our brains got bigger. And once again, because we had more food, we spent more time bonding with each other, and thinking about things. And while all of this was going on, something else began to happen. Sapiens, remember that's us, were spreading everywhere. And everywhere we spread, the other humans began to disappear. Because of our big brains, we were out competing the other humans. Because we could do something that no one else could do. Sapiens could talk and understand things that didn't exist. We went from simple sounds to describing things and places with those sounds, and from describing things and places to describing when those things and places affected us. Finally, we could put all of this information about things and places and other stuff, and we could ask each other what it means. Things could be made up, or something could mean something else entirely. 
We could talk about our feelings or tell each other stories. We could have beliefs and we could share our ideas with the rest of the band. It's this talent that allowed us to gather in huge numbers, from a couple dozen to over a hundred. And we could work together because people bonded over these stories and feelings and made up things. This was the true beginning of our imaginations. And while all this talking was going on, people started doing something else that was pretty darn cool. They made paint and they made jewelry. The first paint was red ochre. It was made from red clays and rocks that were dried and ground into a dust. Then it would be added to animal fat to help spread it on things. The first beads were actually snail shells, dating back to around 80,000 years ago. Shortly after, we started making beads out of ostrich eggs, rocks, and wolf teeth. We even drilled holes in them for string. Because people didn't spend as much time hunting and gathering for food, they began hunting and gathering other things. Things that were rare or pretty. Things like crystals or shells or bones. Sapiens even began doodling on rocks and other things. It seems like, at this point, we took a lot of value out of how things looked. This is the beginning of people starting to make kind of like a pre-art. Sapiens were at the top of the food chain, and our brains were finally the size they are today. People had boats, clothes, fishing hooks, and were starting to chill out with wolves. Cooking had allowed people to stay put for longer, and although people still roamed around, they stayed for longer periods of time in one place. Now that you've pretended to be an old one and an early Paleolithic, let's take a moment and think about what life was like as a sapien during the middle Paleolithic. You look like you do today. You have clothes made of animal hides, and because you are important, you wear jewelry with lots and lots of beads made out of teeth from wolves. It's cold outside, but you and your friends have a fire to keep you warm. And over the fire, you and your friends tell stories and trade prayers. The plants and meat you cooked are soft and tasty. Tomorrow, you and your friends will move the band to a creek bed to find red rocks and shells. And then the next day, you and your band will leave and find a new place to live. By the late Paleolithic, sapiens were the only humans left. All other types had died off. There were no more Neanderthals or Denisovans or any other human group. It's in the late Paleolithic that we begin making true artwork. Art was just another step in our language. It was something that could be seen and was more permanent. Until this point, if a grandfather wanted to tell a story to his son, he would have to hope that his son would tell his grandson the same exact story and not screw it up. A lot like the game Telephone. But art was actually something that could be passed down or shown to people. Something that could teach others. Even if those other people might never actually meet the artist. Most cultures around this time were probably animists, meaning they believed that every object and animal had a mind and a soul. For example, if a volcano was erupting, the surrounding people might pray to it and ask it why it was angry. At this time, humans did not see themselves at the top of the food chain, even though they were. And this might be the reason why so many huge predators are found in cave art. Most of the artwork found in caves are of animals, and not just any animals, big scary animals. Some say that this is because people were animists, that painting these large intimidating animals was a way to contact the animal spirit or communicate with the dead. Maybe it was part of a prayer, or to ask for hunting success, or a rite of passage when the large animal was killed. Maybe it's actual historical records and storytelling, scenes from real life. Nobody really knows, and we can only make good guesses. So far, one of the oldest and well-known caves is the Chouvet Cave in modern France. 
The caves were pitch black. They were damp and they were dangerous. An artist only had their paint and a torch. The paintings sometimes showed drawings on top of drawings on top of drawings. Some people today think that this is to show the animal moving, or maybe it's to show time passing. Others think it was just difficult to see in the dark. Maybe the artist didn't mind the drawings overlapped. And almost always the paintings would be in black, gray, and red ochre. Sometimes paintings would be on the walls or even on the ceilings. Most cave art that we recognize today come from Spain and France. In Lussac's cave, there are over 600 etchings on the walls. And almost all of them are animals. Some of the paintings are even the most accurate description we have of animals that have gone extinct. People would paint with their fingers, moss, sticks, they'd paint with animal fur, they'd paint with feathers, they even painted with a super early form of spray paint. The artist would hollow out a bone or a plant stem and then place that red ochre dust inside. Then they would blow the dust out over an object, most often it was their own hand, and it would create kind of this weird stencil pattern. There were other types of art as well. People still roamed and wandered around. They were spending longer time periods in the same place, but they were still nomadic. So the art they took with them was small and portable, oftentimes little stone figures. Most of these were animals, but one figure pops up again and again, and this is a woman. We named her Venus. The most famous Venus statue is the Venus of Willendorf. She's thought to be a good luck charm, that holding her will help your chances of survival and starting a healthy family. Even though people were a lot better at getting food, life was still pretty rough. She is well-fed and able to care for a family, so it's possible that people who made or owned her would also want that for themselves, and she might help them with that. So imagine you are a late Paleolithic human. You and your band reach a small camp. You have done your daily rituals and your prayers. You hear dogs barking behind you and your friend tries to quiet them. As you look around, not many of your band are older than 30, but there are many, many people. You see huts made of tree limbs and plants and scattered nearby you see cave bear skulls, harpoons, bows and arrows. You look to the right and see part of a small boat being built. Later on, you are given a torch and tools, and you begin to crawl. You crawl down into the darkness of a cave and try not to slip on the damp rock. You feel nervous, but honored because your people have been coming to this cave for generations. When you finally reach your destination, you begin to draw. Your fingers are covered in a red, sticky substance, and you spend hours on an outline of a large horse. After you are done, you carefully crawl back up. At the end of the Paleolithic, sapiens had spread almost everywhere, reaching really tough places like North America and Australia. As the Ice Age ended during the Mesolithic, ice sheets melted and temperatures began to rise, In response, bands of people improved on their little brush huts or their little homes. They started making permanent settlements, living and dying in the same place. This takes us to the last period of the Stone Age, the Neolithic period. If the Paleolithic was all about learning to think and imagine, the Neolithic was all about learning to farm. More and more groups settled down, giving up a life of wandering and roaming around. Part of the reason we could do this was because we had wheat and we had goats. Other than the dog, wheat and goats were the first two things to be domesticated or tamed by humans. After wheat, we began to farm rice and lentils and barley and potatoes and a bunch of other stuff. We also worked with domesticating goats, sheep, chickens... Cattle, (laughs) domestic horses could now haul huge objects and help with heavy lifting. 
People had homes and property. They had things that they owned. Some settlements had over 5,000 people. In terms of art, painting and sculpture were still being done, but most of the focus shifted to building things. Remember, they no longer had to worry about what they could carry on their backs. They began to connect more with their own place of living, with their home. Art got much bigger as a result. The most well-known Neolithic piece of artwork is probably Stonehenge. And this is also the time we start seeing the first masks. Now, both of these creations were further proof that people were gathering in huge numbers. Stonehenge was thought to be a place where people gathered to do a ritual, and the masks were thought to be part of a ritual. If you were from the Neolithic, you would have many, many, many friends, but you would also have many, many, many chores. You would help care for your goat herd. You would make sure that a comfortable fire was going in your home to keep it heated. Your settlement is loud and noisy from all the people, tools, and animal sounds. You take a moment to remember to fix your shoes and start cooking breakfast for you and your many family members. The sun is bright, and as you walk around your home, you admire all your little stone sculptures that have been passed down for generations. The prehistoric Stone Age will always be something like a mystery. Nothing was written down, and there was very little that survived. We do know that for the most part, people were a lot like us. They still wondered about their futures. They still cared about their parents and their children. They still explored and questioned what they saw. And just like today, making things was important. Making tools allowed us to survive. But making art allowed us to reach a place that no other animal or other human has ever accomplished. So next time you're bored in a meeting or a classroom and you start absentmindedly doodling on the size of your notebook, take a moment to be amazed at how truly special and rare a talent that is. So that's the end of this video. Um, again, if you signed up, for the grab and go bags. They'll be at the museum throughout the end of November and you can go and pick them up. There should be a volunteer at the desk and you can just ask them where to pick them up at. All right. Thanks again, guys. Have a good day.